to acknowledge our university and community spot supporters, the University of Iowa's international programs, and the University of Iowa's honors program. They contribute vital time, talent, and logistics to our organization. I also thank the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their financial support, and I thank today's special financial sponsor, the D. Norton Fund. Our programs are made possible by the financial support of these sponsors. And now I'm pleased to introduce my good friend, Adam Bobro. Adam's undergraduate degree is in Chinese language from Georgetown University. Adam is an attorney who received his JD degree from Washington University in St. Louis. He served in the Obama administration for over five years in a variety of positions, most recently as the international lead for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Adam's cybersecurity expertise was recognized when he was named a senior fellow at the George Washington University Center for Cyber and Homeland Security. Adam is the president, CEO, and founder of Foresight Resilience Strategies, a strategic consultancy based in Maryland. Foresight provides advice to clients on the impact of government policy decisions and strategic decisions, particularly cyber enhancements for products and services. I've known Adam and his family for about 10 years since I was at the U.S. Embassy in Ankara, Turkey, where Adam's wife, Christina, was working for me in the political section. And Adam was working on China, of course, in Turkey. So it's fitting that Adam will speak to us today now on U.S.-China interactions in cyberspace. Please join me in welcoming Adam Bobro. Well, thank you very much. And Janice, thanks for <clears throat> that lovely introduction. Um, it is sort of unusual that I was, uh, I was jetting off to Beijing on a regular basis rather than spending my time in Ankara. But um, I was trying to, trying to pursue my, my longstanding interests and my, uh, my professional career while we were there. Um, it worked out pretty well. So um, thank you also to the Iowa for, uh, City Foreign Relations Council for having me here today. Uh, I think this is a this is a great topic, and I'm I'm pleased to have the opportunity to share share some thoughts with you about it, um, and uh, and I think this is a, this is something that is important to Iowa companies and important to uh, to all of us, not just hopefully not just those of us who live in the bubble inside the Beltway in Washington. Um, so let me give you a quick overview. Uh, the the subtitle of my talk is <clears throat> the title that we publicized. And as I went through, I decided that we would need to do a little bit of background and, and, um, and basic uh, discussion before we got to the cyber agreement that was uh, between the US and China, announced between the US and China last September when President Xi visited President Obama in Washington. Um, and uh, so I, I gave it a, a more generic title, The Interactions in Cyberspace. And, and in fact, I'm going to start talking a little bit about the economic relationship between the US and China in general before we move into a discussion of uh, the cyber interactions and the different ways the U.S. and China interact on cyberspace and the different ways that, that the Internet has impacted and is used in, in both countries. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to try and give a very brief sort of um, thoughts on the question of, you know, what, what does this mean for, what does this mean for all of us? What does this mean uh, for, for a company in Iowa or a, uh, an organization in the United States and what, what, what sort of in, in a threatened environment, which cyberspace, of course, is, how do you how do you address that? How do you deal with it? So to start out, talk a little bit about the uh, Sino-U.S. economic relationship. Um, this is a chart that shows us the increasing level of our annual trade deficit with China, uh, and it's something that I think we hear a lot about. Um, that people are are often uh, citing as a considerable problem, um, and I want to suggest that looking at that chart, looking at the, the numbers increasing, um, I've put the, the chart in sort of a, a growth, even though it really is a declining uh, indication, and, and left you with a trend line there, reflecting the fact that the absolute dollar figure of our trade deficit with China is, 
increasing rather rapidly. This, these figures go back to 2004, which was the, the um, very close to the beginning of the time China was in the WTO, and close to the beginning of the time, um, or close to the, to the, or the sharpest part of the increase over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, so a lot of people will point at that and will say that that's, that's somewhat problematic. I would, I would argue that there, uh, you need to look at it really in, in much more uh, context, uh, much, much more carefully looking at other, other circumstances that affect that trade deficit. So on this, on this page, I've charted the, um, the growth as a percentage of GDP. And we can see that it's a, it's a somewhat less dramatic increase, and certainly since the end of the Great Recession, uh, it, it's been a more level um, and, and consistent increase. I've also put up there uh, the curve for the rest of East Asia. I haven't captured exactly all the countries that I was hoping because of the way Bureau of Economic Analysis provides its statistics, but the red curve is the combined trade deficit as a percentage of GDP between the United States, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan uh, added all together. And what you notice is that in the years when there was a steep increase in the percent of GDP deficit that we had with the Chinese, there was also a steep decrease, uh, maybe not quite as steep, but almost as steep with the United, between the United States and those five countries. Part of what the phenomenon of ch the increasing trade deficit with China that we, that we observe is, in fact, uh, a revolution in transport, um, inventory management, and um, supply chain management. So what we're seeing is that China has become a place of final assembly for goods and pro products and services that otherwise came from other countries in East Asia. So that the combined deficit between the United States and East Asia, while it rapidly increased in the years before the Great Recession, has actually leveled out quite a bit. And if we flatten that curve out and look at the trend line, uh, it's not nearly as dramatic as the trend line for the China curve alone, which, which sort of shoots up and intersects with it. I actually had wanted to include uh, a, a selected number of other countries that I think demonstrate this point even more. The Philippines, Malaysia, and Thailand, for example, which also provide uh, some of the high-tech input, input, inputs for many of the products that we use on a daily basis. Um, again, the way the statistics came out, uh, that green curve and um, actually represents our trade deficit with the rest of Asia Pacific, so minus the countries that are already listed, as well as subtracting out India um, and Australia, um, so, so some of the larger economies, but it includes things like Afghanistan. I'm not sure that that is a particularly relevant example. But it, so, so I'm labeling this. You can see that the trend line actually for that trade deficit is downward, but I'm labeling it provisional because I'm not 100% not sure that that, that last chart is, is reflected. But it does give you an idea of the fact that, in fact, our our trade deficit with, uh, with China is perhaps looked at as a raw number without adjustment for inflation, without adjustment for the size of our economy, uh, is a little bit of a misleading, no, um, misleading indicator, I think, uh, and, and that we should be a little bit less concerned about what the, how, that, how that part of the relationship is going. For all that, we're now, I wanted to shift into talking about managing the U.S.-China cyber relationship, and I think that um, in a lot of ways, there are things that we should be more concerned about. Um, so cyberspace, I think, mirrors regular space in a lot of ways. There are a ton of ways to think about what each country is doing in cyberspace, what the relationship is in cyberspace. Uh, there's, there's just citizens existing on, on the Internet, and in that sense, you've got um, China, which has, on the left side, I'll do, I'll do facts about China, you know, over 700 million internet users, and only about 50% of the population that's actually online. Um, in terms of the retail sector on the internet, uh, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty remarkable in China. $700 billion in 2015 was, uh, was sold on chi in China, was sold in, in um, e-commerce transactions, but even more significant, 20, that's 28% of all retail in, in, the, in the Chinese market. So a tremendous portion of retail sales on China and a tremendous portion of com commerce has moved onto the internet. Um, in the international sphere, China has pursued a policy it calls internet sovereignty, the idea that 
countries should be able to control the content, uh, which is probably less objectionable for content that's created within a country. We certainly have, um, for criminal activity in the United States, we, we will take action against cyber, cyber criminal activity. But uh, it also, for China, extends to the, the idea that content that's created outside the country should be in some way limited, either, um, either by being filtered out or by being um, uh, prevented in the first place. Uh, in international internet governance regulations, the internet has been governed on a multi-stakeholder basis, which, which has meant that we've seen non-government organizations, companies, um, uh, standards-making bodies, other groups like that that have a full say when they go into international meetings to talk about the way the internet should be governed, whether that's what standards should apply, whether standards should be adopted or, or updated, uh, ranging through to sort of how the domain name registry system works, and, and all the other technical aspects. China has advocated uh, moving that to the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, which is an, a UN body and would involve seeing only states have a vote in how the internet is governed. So that's, a, that's another difference. Um, as, I dis as I discussed, the, the Great Firewall, as it's known, uh, filters a tremendous amount of information that comes from outside of China um, and, and doesn't allow you access to it. So. Some of, uh, some of the well-known news sites in the West are blocked. New York Times is regularly blocked. BBC is regularly blocked in China, and those are not available to, in spite of the fact that both of those, just to take those two examples, have a Chinese language portal. And so the Chinese language portal is not available uh, regularly in China. And of course, cyber has become a strategic domain. It's become a domain that, um, that we consider when we think about uh, warfare, we think about command and control operations in um, in military uh, operations, and we, we think about um, the, the physical damage that's possible through um, attacks on cyber systems, whether that's taking out through conventional means a, a node in a power grid, or whether that's actually operating through cyberspace to make such an attack and result in physical, physical destruction. So just as a comparison, I, I thought I would put up the, the same sort of facts about the United States. We have fewer internet users, obviously 700 million people is twice as many people as we have, so uh, we couldn't have that many internet users, but we do have a much higher penetration of internet with 85% of the population online or with access to the internet. Our e-commerce market is significant. Again, it's dwarfed in size and outright size by the Chinese, but more importantly, our, our um, retail market is much, much larger than China's. And so that $341 billion uh, e-commerce market in, um, and I think that's a 2015 number, is only 7% of U.S. retail, non-restaurant. It's even cutting out restaurant and foods, food um, purchases, which, I mean, generally speaking, are less amenable to, to moving online. So it's, um, so it's much less a portion of our, of our economy or our, um, our commercial section or commercial se sector than it is in, in China. Um, the U.S. has pursued a policy of free flows of information, uh, and this has been something that uh, was a hallmark of Secretary Clinton's tenure in the uh, State Department, something I think Secretary Kerry has continued to pursue. It's something that at the Commerce Department, uh, when I worked there in, uh, earlier in the Obama administration, we had a, a specific work program to talk about the importance of free flows of information to the U.S. commercial sector and how important data flows are to businesses, um, the U.S. Uh, cloud computing sector leads the world in that space. Uh, and part of the reason for that is the uh, efficiencies possible by uh, having that data move across borders, uh, even for all the privacy and security implications that are involved. Um, the U.S. also is um, dealing with cyberspace as a, a strategic domain. Um, we've seen the formation of a cyber uh, command. So among the, the military commands, which include space and regional commands around the world, uh, cyber is now a command. And the head of cyber command is actually also the director of the National Security Agency. So there's a recognition that there is an overlap between intelligence gathering and intelligence operations on, in cyberspace and uh, military operations in cyberspace. The, there is a classified version, but there's also a publicly available unclassified version of a cyber strategy that the administration put out in 2011. So um, 
there's there's a an instinct at least towards transparency in terms of trying to define what what constitutes rele um, reasonable and appropriate actions in cyberspace, both in peacetime and in war. Um, I will say that some strategic ambiguity is is generally considered to be a good thing in this space. So it's not uh, it's not a perfect blueprint for obvious reasons, but but there is a a publicly available document that you can look at to see how the U.S. thinks about cyberspace uh, in a strategic sense. Um, but I think for all that, I think what I want to focus on today is, is more on the intelligence side, which is to say, we, what, what do the U.S. and China do and how do they interact uh, and what, what problems has that caused? Where have we seen convergence uh, in terms of information gathering uh, in cyberspace. So we see that sometimes U.S. approaches and Chinese approaches converge. Sometimes they, they're similar to one another, and sometimes they're, they're pretty different. Um, and I'll preview that that bottom right-hand corner is, is where I want to focus, I think, for, for most of the rest of the discussion today. The, um, in, but I think it's, it's useful to, to have this matrix to think about What's happening in cyberspace in terms of um, in terms of information gathering uh, activity, primarily information gathering activities. So, so on the left side, of, I've outlined the the actors, whether it's a private actor or a state or state sponsored actor, uh, and on the top, the the targets in the other country. Are they you know government targets or are they private sector targets? I will say that those lines are dark and specifically demarcate the spaces. I think that's not really true. Um, if you want to talk about things like what's appropriate with defense contractors or um, a similar category of state-owned enterprises in China, maybe it would be somewhat different. But but in large part, I think um, it's a useful it's a useful distinction to draw between the private and the public, both in terms of actors and in terms of targets. So, if we look at the situation where you have private actors on state targets. The Chinese regularly cite the U.S. as a tremendous source of, of cyber crime and cyber attacks. Um, it, it stems at least in part from the fact that a tremendous amount of the internet uh, infrastructure is in the United States. A tremendous amount of internet traffic is rooted through U.S. servers. So if you just look at overall internet traffic and then you look at cyber crime, mixed in among all of that traffic, there's, there are activities that are inappropriate. So in discussions between the U.S. and China, uh, usually governmental discussions, the, the Chinese will regularly cite uh, the U.S. as a major source of problems, cybercrime uh, attacks on, on their infrastructure. Um, and the argument on the U.S. side is that that is really related to the amount of traffic that the U.S. hosts on a pretty open network that's not nearly as filtered as the Chinese network. Um, in the U.S., I think we think of private actors operating on our, our networks or attacking our networks, um, government networks, uh, as, a, as a, a goad to more cybersecurity, to thinking harder about how we actually should be protecting our networks um, and, and what practices need to be improved. Uh, and of course, it leads to, those activities can lead to criminal investigation. Private targets and private actors, generally speaking, it's pretty, sim it's pretty similar. Uh, you know, I think both countries agree, and this is a point of pretty good agreement, that, um, that this is cybercrime, that it needs to be uh, investigated, it needs to be prosecuted. Um, there, is, there is probably better communication and better um, agreement between the two sides on the question of how to deal with this type of crime. So there is more, when I say information sharing in that, uh, blue triangle, I'm really talking about things like the um, Cybersecurity Act of 2015, which just passed in December, which tried to establish better cybersecurity information sharing about signatures of attacks in the U.S. space so that companies have liability protection for sharing that information with the Department of Homeland Security. But information sharing across the border is also important. And, and so the U.S. Computer Emergency Response Team and the Commun Computer Emergency Response Team in China have developed more technical um, exchanges and dialogues to be able to figure out how to share information about attacks and about 
uh, activities that are that are problematic in, in their in their cyberspace or in their uh, networks. In terms of state actors, uh, I think the the leaks uh, from Edward Snowden demonstrated to the Chinese that there was um, a big need for them to step up their game in terms of defense. Uh, it was clear from some of those leaks that there was a lot of capability on the U.S. side that was not being um, that was not known before that. Um, obviously, intentionally, that was something the NSA was rather upset about. But the the idea that um, state actors attack state targets or, or try and siphon information out of state targets is really not that surprising. Um, that sort of is the norm for intelligence gathering that we uh, have generally accepted as, the, as, as regular. Um, so it's interesting to look at something like the OPM hack response. For, for those of us like me who had my fingerprints stolen, um, it's, it's sort of extremely uh, disturbing and, and, and very annoying to think that the Chinese government has made off with 22 million records from the OPM's security f uh, clearance files. Um, but interestingly, when the Director of National Intelligence, Jim Clapper, went before Congress to talk about the OPM hack, he expressed grudging admiration for the Chinese and said, if I could do that to them, I'd probably do that to them also. Uh, from an intelligence gathering perspective, that's a government database that we should have had better secured, uh, and that's a government database that is presumably a somewhat legitimate target. It may raise some issues in terms of um, do we need to change the norms, do we need to stop thinking about the way, thinking about information the way we thought about information in, in a Cold War setting today, but you can see that it makes sense that a government target would be uh, something that a government intelligence agency would be pursuing. Um, you know, the, the equivalent is to think that a warehouse full of these files would have taken an insider uh, and um, fancier equipment, you know, something like a briefcase with a camera built into it, and, and weeks, if not months, if not years, to exfiltrate 22 million records uh, on microfilm and it would have made a better, probably would have made a much better spy novel. But, um, but now we have to think about the fact that if we're going to accept those as the norms of intelligence gathering, uh, is the, does the fact that you can vacuum an enormous amount of information out in a matter of minutes, maybe even seconds, um, is that, uh, does that mean we need new norms in that space? Um, and having raised that very interesting issue, I'm going to move on uh, to the next, to the next box, which is where I really am going to focus. So in a major point of contention between the U.S. and China in, in cyberspace uh, is this theft of U.S. intellectual property. We've, we've termed it intellectual property, business, confidential information, um, but really intellectual property captures it because what we're talking about is whether it's an invention that's patented, an expression of an idea that's got a copyright on it, or it's just trade secret information that's held by a company and protected from disclosure, um, it's the foundation of what we think of as the secret sauce for innovation in the United States. And so that's, that's the competitiveness aspect. Is the US economy's competitiveness impacted by the theft of this information from a wide variety, almost an indiscriminate variety of US uh, companies, US um, commercial, commercial entities? And um, we have really prioritized uh, ending this type of of um, this type of activity, much more so in, as I said, you know, in the upper right-hand corner, we want to sit down with the Chinese and figure out how to improve coordination on cybercrime. In the upper left-hand corner, we're gonna we want to up our game in, on cybersecurity. In the lower left-hand corner, there's grudging respect for the two sides and the way they operate. But in that lower right-hand corner, there's a real divergence of opinion, a real difference about the the approach, and just. To, to sort of set the ideological table, if you will, for this next part of the, the slideshow, the, the issue here is really one of um, what we believe about the way our economy works, that we really think that we have this innovation system that works pretty well. Um, we have a better understanding of it than I think most countries do, but at the same time, we also believe that it's a little bit of a, a secret sauce. It's a little bit of a... Mm -hmm. 
something that everyone is doing all the time. There's a, there's a good support for entrepreneurship. The IP system in the United States provides protections for people's <laughs> ideas um, or the expression of their ideas in a way that then leads to commercialization. And that companies and, and in fact whole sectors are built on the premise that if you do the research and development now, that five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line, you can count on making revenues from the, from the commercialized products that came out of those inventions. And then you can plow those revenues back into research and development now for what will be the next products and services that we'll enjoy in, in 20 years. And the, the US government supports that not just by having an enforcement system through intellectual property, but also by having a robust research and development budget which goes out and grants through a variety of different US government agencies and supports a tremendous amount of research, especially in life sciences, in the technology sector, um, and has really developed a, a tremendous amount of pro productivity growth in our country. Uh, or in our economy, as well as supporting um, a lot of the quality of life developments that we've seen over the years. So on that basis, the, the actions that we see happening in the in terms of private information being taken by a public, uh, by a government entity or government supported entity in China is worrying more because of the idea that it would break that virtuous cycle and, and turn it into a, uh, a cycle of decline um, then it is a question of the actual value of the information that's taken, which is, which is hard sometimes to say. So having said that, I will say that um, the, uh, the value, there is certainly a value to that information that's taken. So to, to sort of understand the narrative of what's happened between the U.S. and China over the last, basically during the course of the Obama administration, um, the, the rising level of concern and alarm over these policies on the Chinese side that, that, that has animated a lot of the actions that the US government has taken. We'd go back to 2006 when China issued a 15-year plan for uh, they call the Medium and Long-Term Plan for Development of Science and Technology, or the MLP. And the MLP introduced a concept known as indigenous innovation. And that indigenous innovation concept was a concept that uh, underlay uh, industrial policy within, within China. So the MLP was calling for um, sort of breakthrough inventions. It talked about 16 mega projects. It established uh, sort of the basis for funding a lot of those projects and providing um, support and in endorsement or um, en engagement or um, Incentives, thank you, incentives, right there on the slide. Incentives for Chinese companies that engaged in ind indigenous innovation. Uh, but, but indigenous innovation, unfortunately, at least from my perspective, unfortunately, rewards not only original ideas, it also in, in, uh, awards what's called co-innovation, which is the adaptation of other people's uh, inventions and, and re-innovation, which is really the exploitation of existing technologies in, in, a, in a new, sort of modulated way. Uh, and there was not as much of a um, distinction about the incentives that were gonna be provided to, the com to a company that had engaged in some sort of like really uh, paradigm shift, new invention or new innovation versus a company that just exploited some other technology that it had acquired or that it had, um, that it had somehow come into its possession. So indigenous innovation became a real, um, concern starting in late 2009, really in the first year of the administration. Uh, and it started in, a, in an interesting way. Rather than being uh, focused on this question of cyber theft, it really focused on this question of government procurement. It was the first thing that, that really caught the attention of the US government on, on indigenous innovation. And having spent time talking to some of the, the major US scholars on this topic, like when the policy came out in 2006, people who were down in the weeds and really interested in this topic were, were engaged by it. And they said, this is a big deal. This is a change in, in economic direction for the Chinese and, a, and an, an endorsement or an embrace of government-directed industrial policy that's a little bit different than what the Chinese have done before. But honestly, the government was not really paying attention to it when it came out. And what caught the government's attention in, two, in late 2009, early 2010, was the issuance of a draft uh, um, catalog or, or application process for joining a catalog for government procurement. 
And it essentially said, we will favor companies and the products of companies that, you, that are, are the products of indigenous innovation. Uh, and since indigenous innovation actually was something for Chinese companies, much less for foreign enterprises that were, foreign investment enterprises that were in China, it was uh, seen as an, a discriminatory um, way of applying this indigenous innovation program. Um, because it basically was saying, if you have worked with another company, developed a, a, a product that has been cataloged or categorized as indigenous innovation, you can apply for and get onto this catalog, which will, which will give you a price preference. You can charge more and still get selected over someone who's going to charge less in this government procurement context. And so it really became a, a rallying cry around which some of the dialogues, the economic dialogues that the U.S. has with China, it featured heavily in the U.S. talking points and became something. And the Chinese government actually backed away from the, the particular catalog, but having sort of um, scratched the United States in this regard to some, the U.S. government in this regard, it really became a, a major focus. And we started to see people talking about indigenous innovation and worried about this problem um, in a, in a much more specific way. So how does that become the basis for talking about IP theft uh, by Chinese supported um, operators on the internet? Uh, just to start the sort of the current level of uh, how much loss is uh, estimated. This is a, this is a pretty reasonable middle of the road um, group, the, the commission on the theft of American IP two years ago or three years ago issued this report and suggested that while there are a variety of estimates that probably 300 billion is not an unreasonable one. Um, what I would say about it is, you know, it, and I sort of alluded to this before, it's hard to know exactly. Um, we don't see, you know, whereas we can measure the level of exports to, to, China, to, the, to Asia from the United States very easily uh, just by looking at custom statistics um, for whatever those statistics, foibles that exist, in this case, it's, it's much more difficult to quantify this value in a, in a meaningful way. Um, if you take my research on uh, the best way to develop a new version of Wi-Fi, um, but it's not gonna be incorporated into a product until five or 10 years from now, and then I'm gonna compete with you on global markets, maybe I'm gonna have trouble getting into the Chinese market because you've taken my technology and you're able to market it more cheaply because you didn't do the research and development investment. That's, you know, to try and suss out all of those threads for all of the stuff that, that, is, that is being taken. Not to mention the fact that companies are not always out there trumpeting the fact that they've been hacked and that their uh, information has been taken. It becomes, a, it becomes a very difficult methodological question to figure out how much it really is worth uh, to see this stuff taken out of the US. Um, so one, one way that this change, that the, the, the awareness of indigenous innovation and the, the alarm about it grew to be more specifically tied to the question of theft of IP and, the, and exploitation of that IP or trade secret by uh, Chinese companies against US companies was this case of the American Superconductor Corporation, or AMSC. And AMSC uh, had a very profitable relationship with um, what was uh, a, very, a fairly small player in the Chinese wind power industry, uh, a company called Sinovel. American Superconductor worked with them to make the turbine itself. So Sinovel was building the blades and assembling large uh, wind turbines or, or windmills, and the turbine itself and the software that controlled it uh, was being developed by this American corporation, a company in Massachusetts. And AMSC had a, what turned out to be an extraordinarily uh, productive and extraordinarily profitable relationship with Sinovel. Um, between 2007 and 2010, they saw a tenfold growth in their revenue, uh, largely on the back, 80%, 90% of their business on the back of selling their turbines to Sinovel, which was then incorporating them into their uh, windmills and selling them into wind farms all over China and eventually all over the world. Um, then it turned out that uh, Sinovel decided that they would rather uh, not continue to work with AMSC. They would rather build these things themselves from 
all, all the parts themselves. And so they attempted, apparently, to reverse engineer the software that controlled the turbines and to reverse engineer the turbines and found they were not able to do it effectively. So they hired a, an American superconductor um, employee, a computer programmer who was in uh, AMSC's offices in Austria. They paid him, they flew him to China, and he provided them with the software code, recreated the software code. And at some point when AMSC sort of had the next iteration of code and they were doing some testing on uh, one of the turbines they were building with Sinovel, they realized that their previous version of code was already installed on this, on this turbine when it, it never should have been. Um, if, you, if you listen to interviews, the, the head of AMSC has been very clear about the fact that he did the best not to let this happen. So when that code showed up, he had limited those in the company who had access to it, those in the company who were actually able to, um, to know the, the, the way that the controls worked and therefore was really concerned about it right away. Part of the reason we have so much sort of really definitive information about the story of this case is that they then arrested the software engineer in Austria and prosecuted him under criminal um, trade secrets misappropriation legislation in Austria, and he actually spent a year in jail. Um, but when American Superconductor tried to have this out with Sinovel in China, they found that they were, they were largely blocked from being successful in terms of pursuing a case, a uh, criminal case, or a civil case in China. It did not stop them from filing a multi-billion dollar lawsuit against uh, Sinovel. And, um, but in the, over the course of it, a, a 900 employee company in Massachusetts lost two thirds of its employees. Um, working in the Commerce Department at the time, we heard a lot from the Massachusetts delegation, we heard a lot from American Superconductor, and it became a political issue with shuttle diplomacy going back and forth and the US government officials raising it with their Chinese counterparts and talking about how it was reflective of our concerns about IP protection in China. Um, but ultimately, um, it's, it's really an interesting sort of poster child story for what we, what I said earlier about the, the spiral of the virtuous cycle of innovation being turned around and turned into a sp spiral of decline. Because the, what's happened to Sinovel as well over the last five years since this story broke and since the, the suits happened and everything else, um, they, uh, they have actually fallen back from being one of the largest. 2010 turned out to be their biggest year in terms of revenues, and they have fallen back and become a much less significant part of the China uh, wind market, partially because they have had these clouds hanging over their head and have lost a lot of their international market. So it has been bad, obviously, for American Superconductor, but it turns out to also have been terrible for, for Sinovel. The, um, for all that, this is not a case of a Chinese government hacker sucking information out of a US system. Um, and this is a case of a typical insider threat, a typical trade secrets misappropriation situation um, that gives us a full round trip. It shows us where the IP started out, how it was misappropriated, applied, and then sold back into the market. Uh, we don't have that for IP theft off the internet. Um, there's the tremendous uh, collection of information off of the internet uh, from US companies, but we don't have that round trip. Um, and I'll get to in a minute why I think that's, that's an important thing. So, um, so just to quickly continue the story of how the, um, how the administration sort of pursued this. In 2013, as the administration became increasingly worried about more and more news reports and more and more um, awareness building about Chinese government-sponsored hackers taking information out of uh, US companies, the um, Mandiant Company released its Advanced um, Persistent Threat Report on a particular uh, set of intruders from the, uh, the People's Liberation Army uh, operating out of, out of a building in Shanghai. In their report, they actually include a satellite image of the building. They say they work, this is where they work. They work in this building. And, um, and they documented that based on sort of by anonymizing data to some extent, but based on, on having a large number of clients who had had to mitigate these types of attacks, they had a pretty good data set to be able to say this was going on, it was really a problem. 
and that there was a, v a volume of information that was being taken. And that really, I think, gave the U.S. government more ability. Um, part of the problem that, that the government faced was a lot of the information that it had on similar, similar activities was classified. And so how was it going to make a case in public about uh, this problem? Mandiant certainly helped with that because it was a publicly available, non-classified document that we could point to that was all was all there, and so you know people could, the Chinese government could complain and say it was all made up, but it really is well documented in the report. Um, and what happened about a year later was that uh, in May of 2014, five PLA officers from that unit were indicted by the Justice Department, and with the cooperation of several large U.S. companies, including Alcoa, Westinghouse, and U.S. Steel, they uh, built a case, enough of a case to get indictments, for these five officers who were uh, accused of actually conducting the, the uh, attacks on those U.S. companies. Um, the result of the indictments was that a longstanding dialogue with, between the United States, led by the State Department and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, on the Chinese side, uh, was terminated and uh, I think suspended was the word they used, but basically it hasn't met again. Um, and and um, the Chinese accused the U.S., the Chinese government accused the U.S. government of acting inappropriately, unscientifically was one of the terms they used. And, um, and I think there was some belief that this was a one-off. Uh, if you talk to the Justice Department officials in charge at this point, they will tell you, they will swear that they will prosecute these gentlemen if they get their hands on them. But I think we all know that they're not going to get their hands on them. They're not likely to travel to the United States since uh, their names are known and they're well aware of the fact that they have indictments outstanding. So, um, so it, does seem, it did seem to be a bit of a one-off. In fact, in recent reporting, it seems, it in, seems to indicate that the PLA has, to some extent, decided that this is not worth it and uh, the Army has transferred its cyber activities somewhat to the Ministry of State Security, which is the Chinese intelligence services. Um, so to some extent, it could be seen as, uh, at least to the extent that unilateral action can have an impact, that this had some level of impact on the activities of, of the greater Chinese government's um, hacking program. Um, the, the problem with indictments, I think, or major problem, major part of the problem with indictments is that it, they're not really great foreign policy tools. Uh, we use uh, sanctions really to talk, to, to respond in strategic ways to economic actions of, of foreign countries or, or entities and individuals. And so a year ago, in April of 2015, the president signed this executive order, which created a, a framework for announcing sanctions against entities and individuals who uh, engaged in cyber theft um, and um, and, and ways of essentially cutting them off from the U.S. financial system and otherwise uh, preventing the import of products that, that result out of that activity. Um, the, the upshot of these sanctions was that when they were announced, everybody said, oh, this must be for Chinese actors. But there was no immediate announcement of sanctions. Um, this happened in April of last year, and then uh, there was already an arranged summit and state visit for President Xi to come to, the, to Washington uh, in September of 2015. And in late August of 2015, there were news reports that indicated that the U.S. government was right on the verge of putting, uh, putting sanctions onto Chinese entities and individuals. And the only real question was, would it happen before the Chinese president came, which would have been extremely embarrassing for the Chinese government, or after he left? Uh, as soon as those news reports happened, uh, the, the head of the new National Security Council, the, staff, the chief staff person of the new National Security Council in China, appeared in Washington with a delegation and said, how can we solve this problem? And uh, through negotiations, uh, came up with, with somewhat of a solution. The, the U.S. government had been propounding through a U.N. process a series of norms about behavior in cyberspace. And one that was held back from that process was actually a norm that addressed this, this issue. And that was something that the Chinese government or the Chinese president and the U.S. president announced as, uh, as an agreement in September. And that was that the two countries agree that neither side will engage in this type of state-sponsored cyber theft. Um, Xi Jinping actually became the uh, 
cyber diplomat in chief over the course of the fall. He went and met with the UK government, and he and David Cameron agreed to agreed to agree about this. I don't think they actually released it publicly, but regardless, at the G20 meeting in Antalya, Turkey, in November, uh, this this language almost to to the word was included as an agreement of all 20 economies that the that none of those countries will support cyber theft of um, confidential business information or trade secrets or intellectual property, and that uh, that, that was going to be a normal behavior. So I guess the real question is, do we see any diminution in the number of attacks, see any lessening in the amount of, of information that's being taken? Um, thus far, there hasn't been sort of a definitive statement, but there have been uh, a number of, of cases in which we've heard either government officials, both the um, director of the NSA and the director of national intelligence have testified on the Hill, and both of them have said, we haven't really seen any diminution. Um, what worried me about those testimonies was they also said, we also haven't seen a round trip, which I mentioned earlier. It's, we haven't seen these round trips of products coming into the United States market that were the products or were a result of this, this cyber theft. Um, and I think that's a somewhat dangerous way to, to change. The sanction standard is reasonably likely to cause harm rather than um, focused on uh, whether or not we actually see a product that comes back into the United States. But generally speaking, we have not seen much of a diminution in the level of activity by the Chinese-sponsored Chinese, Chinese -sponsored agencies. We have seen, though, that the momentum has shifted to some extent, and the, the administration is, is less focused on moving forward with this uh, the sanctions regime or with, with urgent action in this area, having gotten this agreement. So continued vigilance is certainly, certainly required. So let me just say one final thing, because I'm about to run out of time. Uh, and that is, uh, what, can, what can all of us do? What can any of us do about, about this? To some extent, I think it's a question of uh, doing the best you can on defense and thinking about what your cybersecurity uh, looks like. So there are two documents that I've, I've thrown up here on the, on the screen, and they are um, re related to um, changing the way that we think about cybersecurity and the way we think about cyber really within our organizations. Well, very important is to think about protecting critical infrastructure by changing cyber practices and moving from an incident response approach to cyber to moving to an enterprise risk management approach to cyber. These are both, these are things that, that are highlighted in that framework that was issued by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, but was created by a coalition of um, private and public uh, actors and, and, and organizations. Uh, and it was adopted by, by uh, the governor of Iowa when he issued this executive order to talk about uh, how, how to protect in critical infrastructure in, in Iowa. The voluntary, uh, this type of voluntary framework can really help make that change possible uh, and start to get us to think about what are the cyber aspects of our, of our full op range of operations of our products and services, not just our IT infrastructure and uh, and the desktops or the laptops that sit on our desks, but really what are the things that can happen if you send your product out into the world, if it's your gas turbine with an industrial control system or a SCADA system, or if it's, uh, we saw last year, a report that uh, Jeeps, Jeep Cherokee keys could be hacked over the internet and driven off the road, that, you know, you have to think about these things before the products are actually developed uh, so that you don't, you don't endanger your customers. Um, and that information sharing is a critical, uh, critically important component. So getting the, the threat information out there to make it less possible for uh, bad actors to share that information and to continue to use the same vulnerabilities and the same uh, mal malicious software to, to gain access to computers is, is an important uh, additional step that needs to be taken. So with that, uh, I will gladly take questions. Um, let's start with a, with a China-specific question. Uh, the question is, how easy is it for the Chinese to bypass the Great Firewall? So it's become much harder in, uh, with some of the recent uh, hardening of political discourse in China. So in, in conjunction with that, we've seen President Xi visit the offices of uh, Xinhua, the Chinese news agency, and talk about the fact that news reporting is not just uh, 
a information service. It's also something that has to be done with the thought of the party and its leadership of the country. Um, and so you've seen politic politicization there. And the censors, I think, have become a little bit more difficult. So there used to be a fairly good tolerance for virtual private networks, especially for foreign invested companies that needed to get access to information outside of China. And we've seen some of those really come under much more specific attack so that Whereas it used to be, you know, if you were an expat and you set up a, a VPN and your organization in the United States was giving you access, now those channels are sort of more shut off. Uh, and, and I wouldn't say completely shut off, but like it's much more difficult to get access to that information uh, than it was. Here are two both general and specific questions. One is how precise is the tracing of cyber attacks? Uh, and is the cloud safe? So not that you have all the answers. Not, I, I, right, I don't have all the answers. But um, I would say, so <laughs> the, the tracing of cyber attacks turns out to be um, reasonably precise. Uh, we can see, we can sort of, uh, I'm, I'm more of a, an organizational expert than I am a technical expert. So I'm not the person who's digging around inside the systems that have been compromised. But if you talk to the cybersecurity experts who do that work, they say that you can tell because of the way that the cyber attacks are conducted, the, the length of time that the different groups choose to st sit on a system before they act or before they take information out, the malware and the signatures of that malware that they use, um, it would take it would take a lot of effort by another organization to mimic really carefully, and then also the the internet routing. So, you you learn over time the the internet addresses of the nodes or the servers that are used. Usually not the ones directly in country, but like the three the one or two steps away from the attackee or the victim, and maybe ten steps away from the attacker. But like you learn what those nodes are, so you see those nodes used repeatedly. You see the same malware, the same signatures. You see the same dis, uh, same general conduct. The Mandiant report, for example, documented that this was a this was a business day activity, that it picked up at nine a.m. or eight a.m. China time. It dropped off at lunch, came back on in the afternoon, <laughs> and then disappeared at five to six p.m. China time. Of course, if you're a Russian hacker, you could mimic that. You could say. I want people to think this is a Chinese attack. I'm going to do it on China time. But you know, over time, and especially in the Mandiant report, before the Mandiant report came out, I'm not sure people really thought, the people doing the attacks really thought that much about the fact that their behavior was leaving that type of a signature. So in terms of the security of the cloud, um, it's really hard to say. I mean, you know, the, 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 quiz, is, the quiz is really interesting that the, that, uh, um, the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council put together and left on our table, how many computers uh, are, are vulnerable to attack? 99%, right? I mean, if, if you are connected to the internet, then you are, then it is possible that you can be, that information can be uh, exfiltrated, that you have vulnerability. It's, it's hard to say. I mean, there are um, what are known as zero day uh, vulnerabilities, which means that people, security researchers or black hat hackers have gone through, figured out how to break into systems, and then are waiting to use that vulnerability. Nobody knows it's there. Um, things, things in that regard may be getting better. Most major technology companies over the last decade have moved from being very opposed to security researchers, researchers and white hat hackers to actually um, incentivizing their behavior. So now almost all the tech major tech companies have uh, bug bounty programs for people who find vulnerabilities in their system that, they, that no one knew about before. If you then take it back to a Microsoft, Facebook, an Apple, Intel, or whatever, they will give you money for that. And they will say, thank you for giving us this. We'll give you $1,000, and we'll fix the problem. Um, and that's, that's a big change and, I think, an improvement. The flip side to it is individuals and organizations don't, don't solve the problems that they know about, which um, MITRE, which is a um, federally funded research and development organization in Washington, maintains a list of common vulnerabilities. And the top 10 vulnerabilities are, have been known for years, and they're still not patched in a huge proportion of systems. And so that's a, that's a major problem, like updating software and keeping your stuff up to date and making sure security patches are applied is really important. Thank you very much, Adam. I'd love, I'd love to have, him, have you answer more questions, but I think we're out of time. <laughs>
So we now conclude our program. On behalf of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council, a big thank you to Adam Bobro for his presentation. I also thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. And we also thank today's financial sponsor, the D. Norton Fund, as well as City Channel 4 for making our programs available to viewing audiences. Adam, as a small token of our appreciation, we present you with the coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations mug. Thank you so much. Thank you again for joining us. We are now adjourned.